Well, everyone, I thought I would jump on this morning and just do a very, very quick overview. I uh, was up a little bit later last night because I wanted to be able to address this issue right away. So we know that yesterday the minister did his fancy little announcement. And uh, if you if you slide over here to uh, the Twitter feed of the minister, you'll see that he had this lovely announcement. I was complaining originally that um, that there was nothing released. And then finally, they did actually release it. And you can see the plan is all set out right here. There's a link in the description below, as well as uh, comments for this plan. Well, most people, when they talk about this, they they look at it and they say, oh, it's complete fluff. There is nothing new. There's nothing that I can gain from this. And I'll be honest, they're wrong. Because in there, Minister Fraser right here, and as always, we, ha we have the minister joining me as well. Um, I can tell you that there are some little gems in there that if you are not reading carefully and reading through the lines, you are going to miss out on some things that can and will impact your decision-making going forward for permanent residence in Canada. There are little nuggets in there that deal with you guys that are outside of Canada, and there are other things to help drive the decision-making of you guys inside Canada. And yes, don't get me wrong, when you read through that document, you flip through all of the information that's contained um, right in here. On the surface, it looks like stuff that the minister has talked about on many occasions before, and I don't blame you for just skimming through it and feeling like there's nothing that's there. But what did I do? I did not accept just this flat out, you know, uh, I guess the messaging that's been going around that there's nothing in here of value. It's simply not true. So I've got six takeaways that I'm going to share with you today that every single person who's looking to immigrate to Canada had better pay attention to. To make it easier for you guys, yes, I'm, I just don't like writing anymore. I'm so tired of it. But I sat down and I wrote my top six list of key takeaways from the minister's report. And that's what I want to go through with you guys today. So those of you who are tuning in live, there's not going to be an opportunity really during this session um, to ask too many questions. I may hit on a few at the very end if you stay with me, if you stick with me, uh, because I'm going to do my live Q&A right after this uh, at 10 a.m. So don't go away. So, but I'm going to zip through these, try to keep it uh, short and concise. The blog post here has a lot more detail in it, but I'm just going to hit on the main, main headings as we go through this. Okay, let's dive in. So this strategy, we know where it came from. This came from, and the policy document, you can read it yourself right here. We talked about it briefly yesterday when I was talking about it right in the midst of our live stream complaining that it hadn't been released. Um, so this is a private member's motion, M44, introduced by MP uh, Randall Sarai, who was also a Liberal member of Parliament. Once again, why did they need to do this? I don't know. When we look at all of this, we can see that this is a lot of stuff that the government has already been working through. And um, and so why did they need to do this? I don't know. Apparently they did and everybody's her, uh, you know happy and uh, all of the members of parliament in Ottawa that voted on this voted in favor of it. So that's kind of the backstory. So minister had 120 days to respond. And indeed, as we can see here, um, I guess that's mine. Let's go to Minister Fraser right here. We're back. He kicked things off in the first session, the beginning of the session uh, yesterday. And this is what we have today. So you can go through, you can read it yourself. Um, but ultimately, the minister broke it down into a couple pillars. But what I'm going to do is pull out and extract the, the top six things that I think people really, really need to pay attention to that are maybe not clear or at least readily apparent. So enough Without, enough with that, let's jump in and let's take a look at it here. Okay, so you can see, yes, there's lots of fluff. Number one right here, work experience in key sectors will be increasingly important. So to start off with, if you are someone outside of Canada, and this is the hard part, who is looking to apply on human capital alone, you don't have a connection to Canada, more than ever before, immigration is going to be tied to the labor market in Canada. So you know, when you look at uh, what the report indicated that, and I'm going to try to increase this just a little bit bigger so you guys can see it, you know, 957,000 vacant positions at the beginning of 2022, and over 58% of them were high school education or less. But what the minister identified was 
industries and they were embedded within certain parts of it, but industries that are the government, we know they're going to be focusing on. And he indicated very clearly that express entry is changing and that there will be targeted draws we expect in spring. This is all stuff that, you know, everybody's been talking about. But what I did was I pulled out the industries that were alluded in there and some that were, you know, not readily apparent because they were embedded in other paragraphs. But you can see health, hospitality, transportation, trades and resources, IT, engineering, agri-food, agriculture, construction was embedded in there, professional services was embedded in there, scientific and technical services was all embedded. So if you are an individual who is sitting with a comprehensive rank, comprehensive ranking system score that's you know you've got a master's you've got good experience but you don't have any Canadian experience all is not lost in the beginning of next year we know that the minister will start to do targeted draws now he has he can take them any way he wants he can choose to just do it for CEC candidates and then make the Canadian work experience that's tied to the labor, labor market the only thing he's drawing he could focus just on people that have work experience in certain knocks and which industries which knocks you guys better be looking at this stuff right here, this list, because those occupations that fall within those industries are likely where the minister is going to be going. So those who have human capital outside of Canada, you know, French language ability is still there. But what is this saying? More than ever before, work permits are going to be something that is going to, you know, and job offers are once again going to have uh, presence in this whole process. Because over the last few years, it has been virtually impossible for people to get job offers from Canadian employers. But that leads us to number two, which is job offers from Canadian employers will be much more plentiful and essential going forward. When the government has said repeatedly that they are going to be placing emphasis on permanent residents that meet local labor conditions, that meet labor shortages, that is code for more labor market imp impact assessments are going to be granted. More Canadian employers are going to be looking to hire from abroad. I am right now aligning myself with some recruiting companies that I actually trust because I've got companies who are telling me I'm short 5,000 employees, right? We're short, you know, across industries. And that's exactly what the minister, you know, indicated. So those industries that I listed in, in, in number one here, these industries are ones that you have to pay close attention to. Now, I'm not saying that the minister couldn't choose not codes that are outside of these industries, but that's where things are starting. That's where, you know, things are going to start moving forward. Okay, so like I said, the job offers are going to be more plentiful. And this is something I want to point out here. So you can see here, why is this emphasis on TR to PR pathways? And the whole purpose of this report was to identify um, and expand, which I don't know how much expansion is actually done, but to help people realize how truly important Canadian experience is. And if we go right into the report itself, you can see here, the report highlights that immigrants with previous temporary Canadian work experience generally have better labor market integration and are unlikely to experience the same degree of difficulty with the transferability of their human capital. What does that mean? It means that when people are looking to immigrate from abroad that don't already have Canadian work experience, they run into that glass ceiling a lot faster. They run into challenges getting their foreign work experience, which is awesome, accepted by Canadian employers in the Canadian market. But if you've gone to school, you've worked, you have um, integrated already into the, the labor market, well, issuing you an invitation to apply, there's a greater likelihood, at least in the government's mind, that's what this report is saying, that the outcomes are going to be better. And they want people who can settle and use their skills and help our market, our labor market recover and our economy, you know, drive the ship to pay off all this massive debt that the government has, uh, has got us into. So gone are the days when human capital alone are going to be sufficient. You absolutely need to consider option one right here, just like it's always been there, studying in Canada, obtaining a post-grad and then flipping to PR or securing a job offer from a Canadian employer, getting that work permit, and then once again, PR. I know this is not new stuff, you guys, but I want you to understand the gravity of it. So, you know, although things are not all lost for, um, for human capital loan, those individuals abroad, if the minister chooses to do more strategic targeted draws, it could very, you know, very well drop the CRS scores, but Canadian experience is going to be driving the ship now and for years to come. So, Think about that as you're planning your strategy of coming to Canada. Those who are in Canada, 
You guys are in good shape. I know that everybody's frustrated. You postgrad work permit holders have gotten 18 month uh, extensions on your postgrads. Um, those who are waiting for the draws and the CRS to come down, it's slowly creeping down as people are getting flushed out. And come the spring, the minister I think is going to start to ramp up the targeted draws that are focused on who? You foreign workers in Canada. So that's number two. Number three, something that has alluded to that once again has come up, but people need to understand you guys that are traditionally gaining work experience in low and semi-skilled worker positions, well, express entry is, is going to open the doors to low-skilled work experience in Canada. So I'm not talking about the creation of, of a new TR to PR pathway. I'm talking about the ability that the minister has to specifically identify what we now have as low skill positions and pull them into the context of express entry. Now, with that being said, I want to slide back to my website here and I'm going to, I'm going to pull up one other article that I want to, uh, one other blog post that I want to address for you guys. And let me just pull this up. Okay. Just give me one second. Um, Chanel and Cedric in our office did a blog post on, you guessed it, tier. And uh, let's just see here, blog. I've got my, I've got this so big here on my screen that that's why I can't find anything. So on our website, if you go to the, um, the blog post, which is in uh, resources and then blog, you'll see that we have, uh, we, you can do a search and pull up articles on different topics. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to pull this up here, this article from, that was written by, uh, by Cedric and Chanel, um, and then tie it into what I have here. So you can see that the minister, he's indicated that low skill or providing options within express entry that cross a variety of skill levels. What he means to a large extent is tier. And if you go to our blog post here, and I'll provide a link in the blog itself, but there are winners and losers, and there are occupations that are going to get sucked up that were low skill that are now going to become skilled in the context of, of this process. And, um, and so take that into consideration and understand that, that with tier and with these changes, the minister has the ability to now include people that have traditionally been excluded from express entry into the process. So that's number three. Okay, let's uh, enlarge this critter again so you guys can see a little bit better. Okay, number four, rural Canada is on the rise. So what I mean by that is the minister, as you can see, has indicated as one of his pillars that rural communities in Canada, they are desperately trying to get immigrants to go move there. And so what does that mean for you guys? What it means is rural northern immigration pilot, well, yeah, that's an option. It's you know, there, there's, there's spots there. Who are getting those spots? It's post-grad work permit holders who are actually moving to those communities on their open work permits, moving away from Toronto, moving away from Vancouver, moving away from, you know, Montreal, the larger centers to smaller communities who are within the RNIP. And they are the ones that are getting the spots, not people who are getting jobs very rarely from outside of Canada and then immigrating. They're people that are already living and working in those communities. If you're on a post-grad work permit, you're here in Canada, Pay close attention to where the rural and northern immigration pilots are, and that's something to consider. But once again, the minister is bringing forward this concept of a municipal, that municipalities, a municipal immigration program. How that differs exactly from the RNIP, I guess we'll see. It was announced way back in 2019, and they've kept humming and hawing about it. Well, now, once again, it's surfaced in this plan. What that means is smaller communities are going to give you greater likelihoods and greater options for permanent residents. And so as you're, as you're planning your, your, where you're going to work, where you're going to spend your time, where you're going to settle yourself in Canada, at least after you've completed graduation, seriously, seriously, you have to consider these, um, the, the rural communities. And you can see PNPs, rural communities, municipalities, everything working at driving people outside of the traditional centers, the large centers to smaller communities. Think about different provinces that you could go to and go where other people are not. <clears throat> so you have to take that into consideration in your planning. When you're thinking about school, and I'll get to this in my last point, but think about where all the students are going. There's only so many spots. And when you're 
trying to plan for permanent residence, you absolutely have to leave as many options as possible open to you. Okay, another step here. Let's jump over here. Number five, French language ability has never been more important. And yes, like I talked about with the no program specified draws, if you're outside of Canada, realistically, and you don't have a job offer, French language is the thing that's getting people through. So those of mine who are going through the no program specified draws as FSW candidates, it's those who have those extra 50 points or more for French language ability that are getting the um, that are getting uh, scores high enough to, to receive invitations to apply. And so for some ta- time now, we've known, you can see here, that IRCC has a target of 4.4% of the total immigrants being French speaking. And so if that's the case, boy, even if you have a little bit of French language ability, like I say here, it's time to start brushing up. And the sooner your French improves, the sooner you might have an opportunity to book your ticket to Canada. But it's not just for permanent residents. There are programs for French speakers that allow you to come to Canada and get jobs here with employers. If you speak French, the employers extending these job offers don't have to go through the labor market impact assessment process. So those with French speaking language ability have a significant leg up especially in the world of permanent residence. And when it comes to work permits, those who use French habitually as their daily language, um, they can potentially go through the Francophone Mobility Program. So those are the top five. Now I want to finish off this last one and direct it specifically to you international students. Those who have not yet applied to come to Canada. There is something that I know people didn't see. They just did not look at. And that simple fact is that international students have to be strategic about where they are studying in Canada. And like I indicated here in the, in the blog post, tucked away quietly was an acknowledgement of a lack of diversity within the ranks of the international student populations. And IRCC admitted that they're looking for ways to diversify source countries for international student programs. So what is this code for? we are going to start approving less study permits from India and China and more from other countries. So if you're in this situation, more than ever before, you have to be strategic. So here's some of the things that I I talk about with my clients. One, when they come to me and they say, Mark, where should I study? Now, I'm not an education agent. So ultimately, when it comes to schools, I have no affiliation with any schools. Remember, by and large, education agents are paid by schools to get you to go there. Well, we know, and from the reports and the statistics, that um, that the government is going to be looking at a number of factors, and they're going to be really, really pushing people towards remote locations. For work permits, for permanent resident programs, it's all about rural and smaller communities outside of the major centers. Well, <laughs> I'll share this with you again, you guys. If the factors that I've talked about here are important... Yes, you know, they they are. There are other factors always associated with getting a study permit that you can't discount. But geography, where and what you're studying never before is going to be more important. So here's what we have here. IRCC says they're going to incentivize students to look beyond major urban centers when choosing a program of study. So when they say that, I listen. And you should listen too. And embedded within there is the reality that over 49% of international students head to Ontario. So guess where I'm going to advise my clients not to go? You have to take this into consideration. And also, when when I think about this intuitively, and I think about the assessment of the whole study permit regime, you know, it's very, very difficult for me not to believe that they're going to bake this into the as an ingredient into their advanced analytics when applying for study permits. So I'm not going to say that oh your school's in Ontario therefore you're going to drop down to you know to 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 tier 2 uh within you know within the advanced analytics of of IRCC when they're processing study permits. But my goodness, if they if they say that uh they're going to incentivize students to go to other you know beyond major urban centers then that's what you need to do. So when I have discussions with my clients, I routinely talk about geography. I talk about geography and I talk about PR options. Most of the people that book consults with me want to know what the permanent resident options are. 
And so when I'm giving them instruction and trying to advise them on this, I always start with, do you want to apply for permanent residence or is this purely for school? If they say, no, I definitely want to consider permanent residence, then whenever we are selecting where they're going to go, we first look at provinces where the majority of students are not going. You know, we don't look at Ontario. We don't look at BC because there are so many of those students that are competing for so few spots. And if the federal express entry process is not going to be an easy pathway for you, you as an applicant need to look long term. You need to look at the provinces that have the most options available to you. So <laughs> if I have individuals that are going to study in the Atlantic provinces, well, what do they have available to them? Possibly express entry, the PNP programs, and the rural northern immigration program. And in some cases, there are well, obviously the Atlantic immigration program as well. So there's potentially four options available to them if they study and work in those provinces. Whereas in Ontario, for instance, there are some RNIPs, there are pathways through the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program, but they only have so many spots. And if we go back here, and they're saying that over 49% of international students head to Ontario, my goodness, there, there is not enough room to fit all of them. There just isn't. So the clients who are willing to go to different places are going to have a far greater chance of success than those who head to destinations in Ontario, BC, and Quebec. So that's, that's pretty much what I talk about. And like I said, the PNP programs also have some form of incentives, the vast majority of them, uh, baked into their programs to help transition international students to workers to settling in the province. If you started school there and you work there, there's a really good chance you're going to stick. And provinces really like you. So take that into consideration. And, um, and so as you're, as you're planning all of this out, these are the things really that I wanted you to take from this, this plan. Some of it, yes, is, is you know things that we've already talked about. But you have to think past what's in here. You have to think beyond what is written in here and look about the long-term implications of what's happening. So I encourage you to slide over, check out the blog post, review it in detail. I just wanted to hit those high points. I'm going to zip through them one last time to wrap up here. And then we'll give just a few, uh, a few moments for questions on this. But number one, work experience in key sectors will be increasingly important. The sectors are listed here. Number two, job offers from Canadian employers will be much more plentiful and essential. I say plentiful, which I didn't touch on, because Canada's unemployment rate has never been lower. And that's across the country. And it is only going to improve from the perspective of people looking to immigrate to Canada. And if you can secure one of those job offers, not only are you getting labor market impact assessments with an extra 50 points or up to 200 points, depending upon the level of position, but you're also opening up many doors through PNP programs because of the job offer opportunities. So, and all of the other programs in the same fashion. So job offers are going to become more plentiful and essential. Number three, low skill is coming to express entry. We have some indications through tier, the new tier system, which occupations are going to be bumped up, but pay attention generally to these sectors, okay? Because these sectors, these industries are going to be likely where those low skill positions are going to be pulled from. Number four, rural Canada is on the rise. If you have a choice, look outside of the major centers. The minister has repeated this time and time again, and it behooves you to do that. Even though in those larger centers, you have larger ethnic communities there that you can associate with. If you want to become a permanent resident of Canada, you're going to have a better shot going to coming to Alberta, for instance, to study, going to Manitoba, Saskatchewan, going to the Atlantic uh, you know, provinces. So all of that look, and even Northern Alberta and Northern Canada. Okay. French number five has never been more important, which is just an affirmation of the fact if the minister's looking to make sure that at least 4.4% of all those um, landing in Canada's immigrants are French speakers, you know, they're going to blow past that target with the way they've got things set up. It's so heavily skewed to French speakers that uh, if you do have French abilities, Boy, you can come, you can get a work permit, you can apply for permanent residence. Your, your track to PR is definitely fast-tracked. And then finally, international students must be strategic. You guys that are in India and in China, the top source countries, 
more than ever before, you have to listen to what I'm telling you about choosing your schools. Don't listen to your education agents that are pushing you to Toronto because those are the schools that are paying them or to Vancouver. Look to the smaller communities. And the minister specifically talks about incentivizing. <clears throat> Will it affect the processing of your application if you go to the same private school in Ontario that everybody else goes to that has 95% you know, Indian nationals at the school? <laughs> well, Will that play a role? Do your homework because the way I read through this, it definitely might. There we have it. Okay, <clears throat> let's jump over here and let's see what we got for uh, for people that are watching. It's kind of a spontaneous time here, but let's see. Um, uh, so Bar says, what is the use? Well, this is where I'll be a little bit critical of Bar. I know you guys are frustrated and I completely understand it, but you've come so far. Why would you give up now? The reality is the steps that the minister is taking are heavily weighted to people in Canada. Yes, you guys have suffered. There's no doubt about it. You've been in limbo. You've seen your savings depleted. You've wondered what the future holds and still there's uncertainty. But what this plan confirms time and time again, that people working in Canada are going to be prioritized by this government. And in particular, people working in industries where there are shortages and the industries are laid out and Absolutely, they're going to continue to expand. Okay. Um, <laughs> Spider-Man says, hey, Mark, you're on. Anytime that I got a bit from free time. Unbelievable work ethic. Spidey says, hi from the shoot again. <laughs> Hello to you. Okay. Uh, okay, Yusuf says, general question. The report says that the new express entry will be effective in spring 2023. Does that mean from March onwards? Good. Your guess is as good as mine. When does spring start? We went through this with summer, right? And so I don't hold too much to that. Maybe it's March. Maybe it's April. You know, it's it's hard to tell. I don't try to, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't even begin to try to understand um, exactly what spring means, but we just have to wait. Fortunately for the post-grad work permit holders, um, they have been given this amnesty of an 18 month that will push them far enough ahead that hopefully the changes and the tweaks the minister will make to express entry excuse me, will capture um, a lot of them. Okay, LinkedIn, great. We got someone tuning in from LinkedIn. Thank you. I wish I could see who the user is there, but that's okay. Um, okay, so these now let's get into the harsh. I want to get all the comments here. So the minister really hates potential immigrants. From stopping CEC to fooling people with this so-called Motion 44, it is, is, it is obvious. Well, LJH, I, I know many people feel that way. And uh, I can only appreciate kind of where you're, you know, where you're coming from. Um, this whole process of selection of immigration is very, very complex. Never before in the history of Canada have they set in their annual levels plans higher targets. Never before. This is unprecedented. The problem that arose is that Canada took too many international students at the beginning. They accepted and issued too many study permits. And to a large extent, you guys are in the situation you are because immigration approved your study permits. And if they were more restrictive in how many they gave out, there would be way more spots for people to be able to immigrate. But when they opened the floodgates and allowed so many international students in, and you guys bring a lot of money to the economy, there simply was not room enough for you guys to all go through the programs. And so it breaks my heart because you were sold a bill of goods and you were told that pathways would be easy. And you've gone, and who could have predicted the pandemic? And that's all over the world. You look at other countries, I think notwithstanding the positions Canada has taken, there have been um, a concerted effort to try to do the best they could in the circumstances. Um, now, you know, there's no more grace period. They need to get their act together and, and figure things out so that you guys are not in limbo. But how many countries just do what Canada has done for their international students in terms of, you know, amnesties for being out of status, you know, post-grad work permits uh, that are you know, extension after extension when postgrad work permits were never supposed to be extended. I agree that the way they did it was so messy and it caused so much problems and so much pain. But overall, when you look at it, would the U.S. do something like that? What happened to all the students in the U.S.? I, I don't know. I haven't followed it. What about other countries? Some countries have done better than Canada, but, um, but I won't completely throw them under the bus. Uh, but notwithstanding that, um, you know, I, I know that the, the minister doesn't hate potential immigrants, but if you're in that boat, I can understand why you feel that way. Let's see here. Um, 
uh, you're very welcome. Says, uh, thanks for sharing the information. And remember, you guys, that I'm going to be going live at 10 a.m. So I'm just going to answer a few more questions and then uh, and then we're going to jump off. Uh, and then I will be coming right back here at 10 a.m. to uh, have my regular Canada Immigration Live Q&A. Okay, um, let's see what else we have here. Okay, Amrit's got some harsh comments too. It's not all fluff. Seems like a high praise considering it's Fraser the liar. Wow, that's pretty intense. Okay, well, Amrit, ultimately, I guess <laughs> everybody has their opinion. Depends upon how they execute their plan to target French speakers. Um, and, and then Amrit says, hmm, so they can discriminate between the countries using the excuse of diversity. Uh, we're really come full circle with this liberal ideology. Well, I'm not going to answer or, or I don't have too many comments about that, Amrit. Obviously, they want to get a diverse background of individuals from a, a lot of different countries. That seems to be where they're targeting, you know. So ultimately, I can't, yeah, I can't, uh, um, yeah, I can't fault you for your opinion. And I won't. Okay. Um, <laughs> Spider-Man says La Chute is a pretty small and remote town. Yeah, it is. <coughs> but remember, Quebec... <clears throat> It's people outside of Quebec that uh, that they're really targeting. Um, and yes, Ghislaine says the wait is so frustrating, so frustrating for express entry. I agree. You know, and if I can create an avenue, an avenue for you guys to just vent and to frustrate, you know, to express your frustrations, that is totally, totally fine. I have no issues whatsoever with that. You know, you guys need an avenue to vent. And, um, you know, when it seems like no one is listening, right? Okay, let's go to a couple more comments here. Um, uh, Barr says, let, let them give them a door to Canada and I'm ready to stay in Yukon. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so Kanjin says, when they say work experience in key sectors, will they give more marks to, for example, cleaners working in hospitals than cleaners working in restaurants or supermarkets? Well, the, the reality is healthcare right, is on the list. Service-related <coughs> occupations are on the list. So they don't, they only look at, at knock codes. They don't distinguish between people working as a janitor in a hospital versus a janitor for a business, right? The, the, they don't, they, I can't see any world where they could, they could do that. I guess, I guess the minister could do anything, but realistically, it's more focused on the knock code itself. Um, uh, Ariane says, and tuned in from LinkedIn, welcome. Uh, no questions again, Mark. Just always happy to watch your videos. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. I'll I'll get, let's see. Um, <laughs> okay. Let's pull up a uh, Facebook here. Um, uh, okay. So um, Gutierrez says, hey, Mark from Calgary. Hello. I'm heading up there tomorrow. I'd like to ask a question for my friend. His postgrad will expire in a year from now. Is there a new? Is there a news if there will be an extension? And then he says, "Thank you for helping us. Our PR. We are now one year. God bless." Ah, oh, that's awesome. Okay, a little bit of applause there for Gutierrez. Okay, let's wrap up with this. Uh, let's wrap up with that last comment. Um, so the question about extension. So ironically, once again, if you go into the program delivery instructions for the the new postgrad work permit 18 month um, extension that was just issued for 2020, 2020, 2022, 2022. <sighs> That's what happens when you're running on very little sleep. And <clears throat> when you look at that carefully, there is a little hint, and I talked about this in previous videos, a little hint that the um, they will consider possibly re-upping the 18 month postgrad work permit extension again, or a similar program if more people are just not making the cut and they're not able to roll out the programs quick enough. So they did leave that possibility, a very, very short little one-liner in one of the program delivery instructions. So it's possible. All right. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap that up. Thanks so much. And remember, my top six takeaways with further details and explanations are all over here in my blog post top six list of key takeaways. I also want to identify that there are a ton of other blog posts on our channel, and I'm going to shrink this down so you guys can see it here. If you go to resources, click on blog, you can actually search by topic or scroll through all of the list of blog posts all associated with everything you guys are experiencing now. What we write in here 
is what's currently happening in immigration. And it's all about giving you information that you can trust and rely upon. I also want to point out if you go to speak to a lawyer and there's a link in the link below if you'd like to book a consult with us. For the remainder of September, we are reducing our rates and I have reduced mine by $100. It's a September only discount, which flows from now. I probably should have said like September 20th uh, forward. Uh, my consults are only $210 for the balance of this month. I just looked at my grocery bill <laughs> and, um, you know, I've got a, I've got a family, a big family. Uh, my youngest is in, in grade 12. I've got two kids in university. One is a way that I'm supporting down in Chile, but I went to the grocery store and I filled up three bags of, of groceries, healthy food, fruits, vegetables, you know, meat. And it was over $250 for three grocery bags full of food. And I know that you guys are suffering <laughs> because I am. <laughs> and, um, you know, when it comes to consultations, if even dropping it just a fraction, a little bit, provides some help for someone out there, then we're going to try to do that. And obviously, the time that I spend doing these videos trying to help people, I hope, just hope, that you will recognize that our firm represents people. Our Healthy Immigration Law and the lawyers, um, you know, Alicia and Cedric and Chanel are awesome lawyers. And when you're choosing, if you decide, I'm going to hire a representative to help me with this, that you would choose our firm, that you would choose the team of lawyers that I have here that have spent countless years honing their craft. Alicia has been practicing for longer than I have. She's way smarter than I am. And, um, you know, and, uh, and her, her, the consultations and, and booking for her, her rate is also going to drop down to 200 here. So by the time you click on this, it will, it will drop. Um, you can see that all of our rates are very, very, uh, very, very competitive. And so I want to highly, highly encourage you that if you are thinking about retaining a representative to, to hire us. And when it comes to legal fees, I was talking with a client this morning who hired a consultant in Surrey and, and you can see how much do we charge for express entry? Well, we charge $4,000 plus 5% GST. It's cheaper already than other places in the country that are charging 4,000. But we try to keep our rates so that they're reasonable. And, um, and, you know, as immigration lawyers, sure, I could probably charge double what I'm charging. But we're working here for you. We're here for you. And so I'd hope that if you guys were thinking about retaining a, a representative, that you would at least give us a shot to, to show, us what, show you what we can do. And these little videos that I do here are just the tip of the iceberg. All right. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. It was awesome having you. And... Um, yeah, hopefully these tips were of assistance to you. Take care, and I wish you guys all the best as you navigate this crazy world that we call Canadian immigration. Take care.